I got it. So, <laughs> so just just uh, kind of laying the foundation, we're going to have a little fun today on on kind of how we see the future unfolding with the, you know, with the whole data cloud space and really data in general. So we're going to tack it from uh, several different several different perspectives. And as Angie mentioned, I'm going to bring Tyson in towards the end. We're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing, reference the platform to help you future pr future proof and capture some of these trends to really gain some business value from them. So let let's let's go and have a little fun on what the future of cloud data networks look like. I'm assuming everybody's able to see that. All good? All good, Frank. Okay, great. So um, we're gonna start, we're gonna start a little bit uh, with a little bit of market trends. And if I'm looking over to my left, I got a, I got a couple screens going here. I wanna make sure I'm tracking along with what you're seeing. Um, so when we, when we look at market trends, you know, there's always always a handful of fo uh, market for forces in play uh, when you when you really analyze what's happening in a market. One aspect is government, and and you know we see this whole new wave of government regulations, particularly around privacy and data sharing and data access via GDPR, or some of the current uh, emerging regulations within the states, and I think soon to soon to be some national regulations within the United States as well as all the regulations that govern the sharing of personal health information, um, such as HIPAA and uh, other, other, G, uh, other regulatory uh, frameworks across the world in terms of who can see your health data, where can your health data be sure, uh, stored, and so on and so on. So um, don't expect any of this uh, to let up. Uh, that's on that side of life. But on the flip side of life, you know, the positive aspects of a lot of these regulations you know, allow you as an individual to have legal rights and access to your data and, and determine who can see it and who can use it in, in what capacity. You know, in the past, that's been, been the realm of big tech in terms of tracking you from uh, uh, MarTech and marketing tech in terms of where you're going. That's why these, uh, these scary little pop-ups always, always show up when you're browsing. Uh, you're going to have more insight to what's happening on that side of life. So I think that's a good thing. Um, the other aspect is technology, and technology's been rapidly advancing. You know, we still see Moore's law with compute, computing and computing power continuing to double at an even rapid, uh, rapid pace. A lot of that ending up in your hands and what we carry around in our pockets. That's not going anywhere. You know, things are getting smaller and more powerful, and um, even there are a lot of devices and things that are more specialized, but again, very, very smart. And we'll talk a little bit about ambient and ambient technology as we move through the presentation. Um, but let's not forget uh, artificial intelligence. It's been a hot topic. You know, one end you have folks like Elon Musk saying, danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger. But on the other side of life, um, you have folks saying, hey, this could be really good for humanity. Um, and I think there's a lot of pull and tug within what's happening in the AI space. And we'll talk, we'll talk some about uh, where that really is and the evolution and how that applies to data. Um, Market agility. Uh, I think everybody can attest 2020 uh, really measured our ability to be agile in terms of our business models, in terms of how we interact with our employees, both um, you know, within, quote, a protected office environment and even uh, how we deal with almost 100 percent remote remote workforce. Same goes with interacting and engaging with our customers, you know, traditional means just weren't, weren't available to us uh, amidst all the COVID precautions and, and lockdowns and you know, safer at home type policies, um, all for the benefit of, of our overall health. Uh, but it did definitely impact, uh, impact how, we conduct, how we conduct business and it forced us to really think uh, out of the box and not only to how we survive, but how we thrive. And that's not going away anytime soon. I don't, I don't think there's any going back to 2019. The last, the last big trend is data is increasing at an exponential rate. I mean, this has been the trend for the last few years. You know, we're getting to the point, and again, we'll address this a little more in detail as we as we go through the, uh, some of the specific trends. But we're getting to the to the to the point of almost 500 exabyte of data 
being produced every day, you know, more than any, any one person can, can consume. Uh, and so the technologies around and um, understanding that data, being able to process that data, and more importantly, being able to use that data have definitely been lagging. And um, what we've seen is traditionally uh, the ability to do anything there has been uh, squarely in the zone of big tech uh, or large enterprises who have the ability to invest in those tools. But what we're seeing is from the standpoint of as this data data becomes you know larger and 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 more complex, we're seeing the ability to carve out pieces of it into small usable chunks for people. And those tools are driving down to individuals. So those are kind of really the market forces that we're seeing uh, impacting impacting what's happening um, and really kind of uh, accelerating some of the trends we're going to be talking about. Let's drive, let's drive into the first. And, and these trends are, are really meant to build upon each other because you know at the end of the day, they truly are uh, uh, interdependent. So data networks. Um, we see, we've seen a, a pretty rapid evolution uh, from data centers to what is cloud compute and cloud storage. Uh, to this notion of hybrid cloud, data cloud, and now what we call what we talk about data networks, and what's really driving a lot of this, you know, some of that that complexity I talked about. A lot of it is costs and operations, where we're shifting our costs and cost burden um, to cloud providers, particularly for the compute and storage, as we look at look at uh, at uh, cloud compute platforms. Um, but up until this point, a lot of those cloud compute uh, platforms didn't have uh, the processing power wasn't affordable to deal with uh, more complex data sets. And so we, we as an industry, built this, this whole aspect of hybrid cloud, where we'd have some aspects of private cloud or our technologies still on premises, but connected to these public cloud technologies. Um, and what we've been seeing over the last year now is that, that data clouds in and of themselves have become more robust and have um, definitely capacity to handle uh, large and big data sets, as well as the processing capacity there to do it. Um, but it's more than just rebuilding uh, a data uh, a data lake or a data warehouse, which again, a lot of organizations just didn't have the talent and resources to do it. It's more than just moving your data up in a cloud and taking advantage of those kind of technologies. What's really, really emerging is, emerging is this notion of data networks. And, and what is a data network? Yes, it has the characteristics of data lakes and data warehouse, warehouses from the traditional sense, but they're really intended to connect disparate data sets that you don't own, right? So when we're dealing with data cloud and data warehouses, it's all about connecting your own internal data silos. When we're talking about data networks, it's, it's really connecting you with your partners, the business partners and your customers, and really, really fostering um, uh, not a, a business flow or an engagement flow uh, at the data level, at the data transactional level, um, and you're going to see this become more and more prevalent as we move uh, move move through 2021 and beyond. Access. I mean, this is kind of general bucket for a lot of different technology trends um, within within access, um, and really, you know, one of, one of the key trends is serverless solutions. And again, this kind of bleeds back into the cloud side of life. You know, when we did originally cloud compute, we virtualized our computing environment. Now all we're really doing is saying, hey, I, I like a certain amount of process, certain amount of storage. I want it to go up and down as I need it and I only wanna pay for what I use. And um, we don't care how many servers, you know, real servers are behind it or virtual servers are behind it. So think Amazon Lambda as an example. These are gonna become a pretty common, uh, a pretty common service across all cloud providers and, and across all capacity solutions. Uh, next is this concept of data virtualization versus data consolidation. Again, when you talk about data cloud, it's not about dumping all your data in the cloud because in reality, data has gravity. I, I think I had that on the previous slide, but you know, it's hard to move lar large chunks of data. That's just the fact of life. And it's going to continue to do, be that uh, for, quite some, uh, for, quite some, uh, for quite a while. So what we're really talking about is creating a virtualized data access tier that makes all these little, all these disparate data sources look like they're one large data collection uh, where you can manage data access and data governance and, and a whole lot of other issues. 
Um, and so, as I mentioned before, data networks, you got to live outside of your cloud. Your cloud's only one part of your ecosystem. So you got to think bigger than just putting your data up in the cloud. And finally, uh, uh, qubits. Um, I love this because, you know, just recently, the Department of Energy uh, said they successfully did a quantum uh, uh, teleportation. And, and what do they really mean by that? You know, qubit is, is basically the way quantum, quantum computer computers store data and, you know, they're able to store data in multi-state. So they're very flexible. And this notion of teleportation is the ability to trans transport data through quantum entanglement. I mean, lots of big words, but we're starting to see it become a reality. And what does that mean? Um, you're gonna see in the scientific world over 2021, uh, more experimentation, more success, and really the foundation for the quantum internet in terms of, of how we connect things and how we protect things and how we secure things. Now, it's not gonna be there by the end of 2021, but you're gonna see a lot of the technology foundations emerge and it's gonna be really, really pretty exciting. So operations, you know, this is big. This is big for data clouds and data networks is, is really how do you deal with uh, automation? So one, you know, there are a lot of tasks that really should be automated. And so we're entering the stage of hyper automation in terms of really taking humans out of, of a lot of uh, repetitive tasks. And some of those repetitive tasks can be pretty complex in terms of load balancing and failovers and disaster recovery and and loading, uh, loading software and the whole DevOps, DevOps cycle. Um, and so this is only gonna accelerate. So if you're not looking at how you automate, particularly a lot of your IT infrastructure, uh, then you're already way behind the curve. Um, data ops as a service. Okay, we have DevOps as pretty mature field these days um, in terms of tools and, and approaches and thought process. Now we're sliding into data ops. And, and what do we mean by data ops? Data ops, and some people call it data wrangling, is taking what amounts to raw data and organizing it in a way that can be useful for uh, uh, you know, broader analytics and, and making decisions. Um, and it can be very complex and be pretty heavy lift for data scientists. Um, what you're gonna see over the, over the course of this year is that data ops tools are gonna become a multi-billion dollar marketplace. Um, so highly recommend you start looking at what's available in data ops and um, data ops and, and the broader data, data governance tool set, which is the next point um, is, is this whole, this whole kind of, this whole kind of area within data and data management is not just an emerging area. It's a high growth area and a must for any organization that's data centric to really take a hard look at and how they manage and how they manage their overall data assets and, um, both from a uh, all the way from a security perspective to um, to an understanding perspective, which kind of takes us to the to the next area. So again, data networks, and now we're building on operations and how to effectively manage those. Um, you know, uh, what does it mean now in, in terms of your data and your data assets, and how do we go from just data to trusted data? And what is trusted data? Well. Trusted data or the concept of trusted data has been around a long time. I mean, it's been around when I first, I first entered uh, the industry, which is an awful long time ago. So I'm not gonna tell you how long that was, but, but this concept of embedding security within the data itself, you know, our secure or self-aware data objects, it's actually been an era of research of mine for quite some time. Um, but what does it mean to have trusted data? That it's sound and it's reliable, it's accurate and it's secure. So all these things that may, you know, that build on the integrity of the data itself that you know, that you know it's valid and you know it's attested. Um, at the core is this concept, again, as I mentioned, secure data objects. And, and really there are, there are a couple key aspects of secure data objects. And, and one is, is definitely becoming very prevalent because it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you use and access data. So at its core, it's the data itself. And then, and then we strongly believe from a security perspective, you're gonna see uh, security attributes embedded in data, in individual data objects themselves in terms of who, own them, who owns them, what they can do with a particular data object, et cetera. Um, the other aspects are, are the concept, and these kind of go together, um, metadata and attributes. You know, what, what's the basic attributes of that, that piece of data? And 
as it translates to metadata. So in the concept of attributes and metadata, what it allows you to do is represent a given data object in different, in different ways. You know, we see this a lot in the health space, for instance, how inside a, inside a given electronic health record, there's different ways to represent something simple as weight. And I'm not talking about pounds versus kilogram. You know, weight, uh, let's take a child. Was, you know, did the child, was the child fully clothed with their shoes on or, you know, did they just have a hospital gown? And why is that important? Because again, medication dosage for certain types of medications are based on weight, you know, and, and it become, become very critical. So this aspect of really putting data in context through metadata and, and attributes is very, very, very important. You're gonna see that become mainstream in pretty much any type of data management uh, solution. And it's definitely necessary when you're connecting different organizations and different processes, because there's no way we're ever gonna to get to a common, a common data dictionary or data architecture. Um, lots of people pushing that in standards. Um, personally, I think it's unattainable because the rate of data and data production is just growing too, too fast to, to say, hey, we're going to just standardize everything, let alone uh, going forward, let alone going back and kind of revisiting all the data that's in um, all this rich data that's in a lot of these repositories. Okay, trusted relationships. That last app, that last layer on that secure data objects was edge relationships. Um, it's it's time. It's time for graph graph models and graph data data structures to come to the forefront. Um, you know, we've we spent a lot of time forcing data into structured structured definitions like SQL structures or for analytics stars and cubes. Um, really, you know, and they um, and there's been segments, industry segments, kind of specialized segments that have understood the power of graph technologies. You know, we all have a social graph and everybody's heard of your social graph and this notion of six degrees of separation. Well, you're gonna see that emerge in terms of how you build data relationships and, and data constructs. And why is that important? Because once you have these edge relationships and once you understand how they relate to one another and what capacity, you're able then to, to take these kinds of structures and present them in a way that's consumable by um, an application or a business process. So it's time and you're gonna see this notion of the graph model, particularly in data, um, uh, data sets and around personal data really emerge as kind of a core construct. And the last aspect of graph models, they're multi-dimensional, multi really what we're talking about is, is not just how a piece of data relates to each other, we're talking about in, including kind of longitudinal temporal based um, kind, of, kind of data, data sets as well as um, as well as uh, geography or positional and all kinds of other really cool attributes around around the data and because the last thing a lot in a lot of industries there is a time value to data right it's it if something's really required to make a decision in real time it can the value of that piece of information can be reduced over time so what we're really uh, having to do here in these constructs is build in these kind of attributes again within the data itself. Okay, verified credentials. Um, verified credentials is a W3, a World Wide Web Consortium standard, a W3C uh, standard. Uh, there's still some variations in the in the core standards, but they're really beginning to solidify. And they're beginning, beginning to solidify around uh, distributed identities. Um, you know, uh, we we work with an organization organization called Glyph, which is a legal entity identifier for businesses, um, mostly outside of the U.S., but we're starting to see it uh, uh, get adopted within the U.S. And what is a verified credential? You know, think of a digital certificate. You know, in a standard form, a digital certificate to represent a piece of data and attributes of that data. Um, and disconnect it from the data sets itself. So you know, based on the attributes and using cryptography uh, to guarantee the integrity of the digital certificate, you know that is an accurate representation of a piece of data and it has the mechanisms to validate if that data is still uh, accurate and current. Uh, so one, one tactical example of how, how this technology is being used, it's, it's, in, it's emerging as kind of the the preferred technology for things like um, 
health, uh, health credentials in terms of individuals' um, educational credentials, as well as health passports. You know, did you get vaccinated or not? Uh, in a way that can uh, you can share that data without compromising your privacy. Um, so again, it's a way to disconnect trusted and attested data uh, from from kind of trust anchor or trusted sources. All right, so now we have data networks emerging. We have you know the things that float around on data networks, data objects, and how they're related uh, related to one another, and actually security and, and uh, their attributes going with them uh, as they traverse a network. Now let's talk a little bit about making sense of all this data and understanding. Um, again, you're seeing another multi-billion-dollar market emerge in this this whole category called augmented analytics. You know, augmented analytics isn't about data understanding; it's about data preparation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this with Tyson, but we know uh, from our own experience, one of the hardest things to do in machine learning and really advancing kind of uh, intelligent systems is presenting data in a way that works within their algorithms and their structures. I don't care if it's deep learning or fast analytics, it's about, it's about put, putting the data in context for them. And so you're gonna see more and more tools develop in, in this concept of being able to present data to these types of solutions um, around, uh, around the network, be it those that are specialized or those that are a little more uh, generic. Um, and again, you know, I talked about the growth of data. It's important, it's, this is gonna become an important aspect and it goes hand in hand with what we are talking about with metadata and attributes in terms of how data can be re represented and how data can, um, how data relationships can be represented in a way that's consumable both to emergent systems as well as legacy uh, oriented systems. Action, you know, it's all about action. You know, the, you know, analytics to this point in time been descriptive analytics. It's all about what happened in the past. Let me, let me give you a graph. Let me show you some trends. Let me tell you what happened in the past. Well, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you dashboards are, are old school. Uh, they're going to they're gonna go the way of the dinosaurs. Where things are moving very rapidly is prescriptive analytics is to prescriptive analytics. So, uh, you know, and in between is predictive analytics. It's taking what we've learned in the past, building on that and understanding the patterns and being able to predict potential outcomes and then giving you the opportunity to pick, pick something or make a recommendation based on probabilities. So again, it's, this, it's on the back on the back end, it's visualization, but then we when we start getting into learning, it's a little more of deep analytics. And again, right now, the state of the practice is it's gonna be very narrow. Say I'm gonna do oncology, say for pancreatic cancer, and but that's not necessarily applicable to some other, some other field. So these deep analytics are gonna be very specific then we get the fast analytics is these things that help us make rapid decisions as a business. You know, these things that build on the deep analytics and data, but a little, a, a lot faster. And again, a lot more poignant. Um, and finally, we got to put things in context in context of what we're doing. And again, you're going to see tools rapidly evolve into a family of tools, not just one, one big analytics solution, but um, things that, that run the spectrum. I can deal with large data sets, I'm de dealing with very specific data sets or I'm an action oriented decision tool to help you do something. AI, AI, AI is always a fun topic to talk about, um, particularly in kind of the traditional definition of AI. And that's three of these categories are traditional definition of AI. We are squarely in the artificial narrow intelligence. Again, we're talking about about machine intelligence and machine learning being specialized uh, in one area and it solves one problem. And you, you've been exposed to a whole lot of this already in your lives. Every time you, you ask Siri to help you or, or Google or hey Google or um, even some of these smart IoT devices, what they really are is no, narrow intelligence and even autonomous vehicles fall in that category. They're, they're designed to solve a specific problem. And you know, I don't want to jam down the robotics path because really what, what are robotics? Robotics are a container of, of intelligence. You know, intelligence tells uh, a mechanical thing to do something. And again, there's lots of lots of different aspects of this to smart applications, 
the things around visual and visual recognition, which is not an easy thing to do, um, and and what as well as around decision and decision support. Um, but that's that's the state of where we are. That's the state I think we're going to stay in for the foreseeable future, um, at least in my humble opinion. The other two states on the traditional on the traditional path of defining artificial intelligence are artificial general intelligence, where you know this is kind of the singularity everybody talks about, where machines begin to equal human thought. And and really, what's the hardest thing in 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 this category is not about processing data. It's, it's what we do in kind of our cognitive reasoning and thinking and our abstraction and how we can come up with ideas and, and be innovative as people. Um, very hard to get machines to work down that path. You're gonna see the illusion of these uh, of intelligence here in terms of processing data and making and recognizing patterns. You'll see the illusion of general intelligence, um, but it's not really gonna be there. And I think what presents that illusion is is something I'm a very, very big fan of. Again, I've been working in this space for about 25 years, is swarm intelligence. How do you create small, smart, intelligent things and, and let them work together in a way that they cooperate and solve bigger problems? So I think you're gonna see narrow, narrow AI uh, combined with the ability to orchestrate between them, really demonstrate advanced, uh, advanced intelligent type solutions to solve bigger and broader complex, and humans become part of that. I and mean, one of the big pushes in the blockchain, blockchain space has been predictive modeling. So that's, um, which are both man and machine, and it's really, really pretty cool space in theory. You're gonna see more of that. Uh, last is artificial super intelligence. So, you know, this is the, like the person of interest kind of AI. Uh, we're a long ways away from that. And I, I think for us to get there, you're gonna have to see a, a pretty major leap in things like quantum computing and processing and how we build neural networks and really replicate not only what we do as humans, but what we can do as a collective set of humans to, to build a super intelligence. Okay, all about me. Um, digital identity. Um, if you know anything about Burst IQ, you know we talk about this all the time around the notion of a sovereign identity and building attested data attributes or profiles. We call them life graphs um, around an identity. Um, and you know, when you look at this, I, I think this is you're going to see pretty beginning to see pretty mass adoption around digital identities. Um, you got the UN pushing for everybody in the world to have an immutable identity. I think a lot of it's going to be digital, not in addition to paper. You know, health passports are going to push this uh, pretty aggressively, um, and we see it. In, we see it. Uh, the demand crossing over from the health space into every other aspects of our life, including the financial space, and know your customer, and money laundering. You know, identity and knowing who you are, uh, and trusting that identity is kind of the foundation for, um, in my mind, the next the next level of a civil society. Um, that helps protect us from all these bad actors out there. Um, so I, I, I truly believe you're going to see mass adoption of digital identity um, as we move into 2021. Ownership. Ownership is a big deal, right? So if I have these smart data objects and, and these larger attested data sets or I have a profile around myself, being able to know who owns it and who has access to it, or even if there's co-ownership, um, is a big, big deal. So this this comes up in the in the concept of consent, um, individual consent, organizational consent for, excuse me, larger data sets. Um, but in dynamic, it becomes real time in terms of, uh, again, it's situational. And you're going to see these constructs, again, really emerge. Um, why, why we like a lot of blockchain structures? Because we like smart contracts, which is tailor-made for, for uh, problem sets like consent and ownership. Ambient. I mean, I love ambient. And you know, what's ambient? It's it's a bridge between the virtual and the physical world. In in the in the initial set, you know, it really emerged around IoT, where where the environment becomes smart enough to recognize you and your needs and your wants. And we see some of that, some of that kind of technology uh, really becoming mainstream. Some of it's a little scary to me, by the way, because I don't think I want everybody to watch what I'm doing all the time. That would that would. Uh, um, I think that would uh, would be a bad thing overall. 
<laughs> but but we're also seeing the emergence of of the evolution of what was a concept years ago called quantified self, and that's measuring aspects about you and, and with smart and now with smart IoT devices and even things that watch us maybe move in our in our behavior patterns all lets us understand ourselves and lets us create a digital representation of who we are that actually can do things for us. So think our think your own little personal AI buddy or bot that you can send off to go do something for you. So you're going to see, you know, some very specialized versions of this uh, come out in 2021 um, that are that are more for you than say a chatbot is for um, for a business. Uh, and there, there'll be specialized tasks like, did you take your medicine? You know, did you get your, you know, did you follow doctor's orders? Did you do this or did you do that? Did you, you know, you told me to t remind you to call to call your mom. So you're going to see a lot of those things really emerge um, as we move forward. Okay, blockchain, blockchain, you know, I didn't think, I, I know you all didn't think I was going to get through this without talking a bit about blockchain, right? Particularly blockchain and big data. You know, we, we've we been a fans of the, con, the, the merging of, of blockchain and big data for a while. And again, you have to understand our perspective is blockchain isn't just distributed ledger technologies. It's a way of doing things and a way of doing things that, and that, that establishes trust um, and verification of transactions, as well as if you apply it right is a test attestation of data. Um, and we've had a lot of interaction with Gartner analysts over the last year. And lo and behold, on one of their one of their trends, they say, hey, this is year you'll see kind of the convergence of blockchain and big data for specialized tasks. And, you know, we might agree with that because it's not it's not good for everything, but it's good for a whole lot of things, particularly as you move into the this concept, of the data networks and data clouds. Um, and it's not storing data off chain. And when we we, we're going to have a, a whole session just on security here in February. You know, storing data off chain and just writing a hash back to a blockchain, that's not safe. Uh, that's not secure. We're going to tell you why come February. Uh, it's really about taking blockchain's met methods and, and working them all the way up to stack. The ledger, the data management tier, as well as the smart contracts on the consent side. Because at the end of the day, why do we, why are we proponents of blockchain? Again, it's not just the technologies of what blockchains represent, um, and it's a philosophy around blockchain, which which is the fact they are networks. And what are networks designed to do? And again, if you've been around me, you've heard me say this lots of times, right? Network create connections, connect connections create communities, and it's communities that drive markets. So it's the ability to dynamically create these connections and these relationships in a way that has a meaningful impact. Um, on market uh, on the market itself and what's even available in the market and and also i i also believe that it's a it's an amazing amazing kind of way in terms of if if approach right that truly truly empowers individuals and individual liberties uh, and can be used in so many different different aspects uh, to support um, to support that aspect of our lives um, so blockchains all uh, blockchain now is moved from the hype cycle to, in Gartner's world, the trough, trough, uh, trough of disillusionment. And now what you're seeing is, is some pretty solid mainstream adoption. As always, the uh, fintech space is, is a, lead, a leading adopter of some of these technologies. We're not too far behind in the health space. Last, when you bring it, bring it all together, you know, I've always liked the concept of singularity, this, uh, singularity, this event that really is a tipping point. So when you take all this stuff together, you know, the increase in capacity of cloud and cloud computing, all the advancement in data management, the ability now to truly embed attributes, including security attributes and metadata in the data itself and not, not around the system that manages it, um, as well as blockchain and AI and, and processing data. I think you have a convergence of technologies that we're just going to see a whole bunch of amazing solutions emerge. Um, you know, first in point solutions, uh, really solving some of these problems, but second in converged solutions that's pulling that that pull them all together in a way that has a huge impact uh, on our lives in the market. Okay, last but not least, uh, security. Um, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dive deep. You know, it's a it's a fun it's a favorite topic of mine. 
uh, too many too many times security is an afterthought and you we're not we're not to the point to where okay just you know we can embed security in all data and data objects and access and that solves the problem and that's that's part of the solution but security really is a multi-dimensional approach it really is a is a layered approach and as you as you go through your own digital transformation and you go through kind of your migration into into cloud and cloud frameworks um, our CEO, Brian, and my co-founder, Brian Jackson, is going to spend a whole webinar talking about best practices in security um, and what does that mean as you move into the cloud? What does that mean in terms of managing data? What does that mean in terms of protecting your intellectual property um, and, and your business, really? Because none of us want to be uh, on the front page tomorrow saying we had a massive data breach or a massive compromise or we're were the victim um, of I identity theft, which is running rampant now in some of our states around unemployment benefits um, or, or you know, any kind of ransomware type attacks. Um, so it's a fun topic. I hope you tune in with us uh, next time. Uh, and that, that really uh, concludes the presentation. What I, what I really would like to do now is uh, bring uh, Tyson, Henry, uh, Tyson Henry in with me just for a short conversation on a couple topics. I'd like to save a couple of minutes at the end, um, you know, for some questions. So I think we got about 10, 15 minutes to, uh, to really hit a few topics. And what I'd like to do in this conversation, a little more of a fireside roundtable chat. I mean, you heard me talk about what we view as some of the trends, particularly in data clouds and data management. Um, some of these you're really familiar with. I mean, we talk about this stuff all the time and have for the last four or five years. What I'd like you to explain um, in a couple different dimensions is how we've internalized that in the product we built and how we begin to lay the groundwork to, to make it future resilient. Um, I'm not gonna say future proof because I, mean, I don't think there's such a thing, but resilient. So first of all, talk about talk about what, what we do at the data, the data access layer around, you know, kind of our schema on read approach and what does that really mean from our perspective? Well, sure. Hey, thanks, Frank. And what, what we're talking about when we talk about scheme on read, and a lot of this is um, comes from a, a NoSQL concept where you store data in its more truer, rawer sense, and you you do like just in time transformations as you're pulling data out uh, to then manipulate it for use in some kind of either analytics, whether it's uh, machine learning or AI or even you know prescript uh, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, um, or historical trends. Um, but when we're talking about how Burst IQ does with software data objects, merging that technology with blockchain, which includes data ownership, and then allowing the data owners and consented users to access data in a way that then they use it in their natural state, allows us to move, move that data in, in ways that um, traditionally required, you know, a lot of heavy handed servers and different teams to take out data and move it and transform it for this use or this use. And, you know, then you find cases where um, somebody says, well, I want to ask a different question. Well, as soon as you ask a different question, now I got to do something different with the data. So taking the uh, blending these concepts into that big data idea of then manipulating the data just in time is what really kind of unlocks a lot of different functionality within the Burst IQ platform. But then you can always take that data back and trans, uh, translate it back to where it originally came in. It's immutable form, who has the data ownership and what security attributes are on it. So now you have this life cycle of data from its inception to how it's been used. Yeah. Well, thanks. And, um, you know, I, I personally, have, I've been amazed the way you've been able to pull a lot of this, this stuff together, even before people were talking about it. I think a lot of it's really pretty cool. Let's me get my geek on. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So, so I got, an, I got another question. Um, again, we talked and you mentioned how we do data objects and, and stuff like that. Talk a little bit about the notion of graph modeling and, and you know what we talk about in, in the form of life graphs and what that means from from a broader um, business acceleration perspective. Sure, and, and and life graph is again it's a variation on the schema on read, but instead of just taking and transforming it in maybe what most people are familiar with when it comes to RDBMS tables or or cubes and schemas, 
really we're taking a longitudinal record. And if you've ever played with a kaleidoscope and you look through it, and then you turn the end, you all of a sudden you see different patterns emerge and you start seeing different things. But inside the kaleidoscope tube is the same thing that was always there. You're just changing your perspective and your view. So now if you think about how blockchain technology works with software data objects, what we're talking about is using that and its edge relationships and its ownerships to produce what is more in tune with what we see in real life. Um, Frank and I have a relationship. Um, he's my boss, but he's also a friend of mine. And, um, you know, I have a relationship with a former coworker. And um, you start to see this represented in social graphs uh, or social networks all the time, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and you're connected to this person, I'm connected to this person. And um, a lot of the Intel community has really leveraged the notion of graph theory and graph databases in order to answer questions that you really can't answer with a traditional database or even a SQL. It just puts a different perspective and a lens on the original data. So when we talk about life graphs, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about taking this idea of a graph and using the blockchain data in its rawest form, in addition to its security elements, its ownership modules, um, edge relationships, and you saw the, the diagram of self-aware data, all of that comes into play in order for us to produce a life graph. And it's not just one life graph. And that's what really gets exciting about it is I can take and I can produce a life graph about myself around who um, I might be related to as far as um, what my career history has been. But I could also then go and do the same life graph and turn that kaleidoscope lens. And now I can see that I saw this doctor, but this doctor also saw these four other patients. And I may not know who those patients are, but I know we were all operated on at the same hospital at roughly the same time and the doctor used the same type of supply. Well, all of a sudden that starts unlocking all these questions about if a supply is recalled, what doctors were involved, what patients were involved, and the idea of unlocking that becomes much simpler in a graph theory. So when you start using um, the combination of blockchain and NoSQL and data ownership and consent contracts, smart contracts and, and graph databases and graph theory, and you merge them together, you start to unlock a whole lot of power within the Burst IQ platform. Okay, I'm gonna throw one at you. Um, you know, we've talked about this and, and saw it. So if, if I go, if I'm a purist in the verified credential space, we're gonna say, hey, we don't need blockchain. We can do all this stuff without blockchain. Yep. Um, I think we have a little different opinion on how, how all that stuff fits together. You mind sharing a little bit of your views of that? Yeah, and, and verif verified credentials and DID um, go hand in hand. And, and it's really an extension of the idea of Burst IQ has had all along. And we've leveraged blockchain in order to produce um, two types of verification on, on what we call digital assets, or you, know, you can think of it just as a data or a software data object. Um, if I store a piece of information on the blockchain, such as my driver's license, um, the blockchain will enforce immutability, auditability. It'll prove that the data I put in is the same today as it is next week or next month or next year. But what it doesn't do is provide any type of verification in the business world of, did somebody actually look at that driver's license and say, yeah, that's Tyson Henry and that's his picture. And I agree that that's a, 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 his, his driver's license. So that becomes another piece of the verified that gets recorded on the blockchain. So now you have a technical and a business verification of a credential. So that's stored on the blockchain. That does me a lot of good for a lot of different use cases, but it's not portable yet. Now you enter into the W3C verified credential. And what that does is it allows me to port that verified credential, that verified piece of information out of the Burst IQ platform to someone else. So let's say um, someone has to prove that I'm over 21, which by the way, I'm way over 21. But let's say um, I could produce a verified profile and a verified credential to somebody electronically. And that thing has been issued by some authority and that authority can be the blockchain. The authority can also give me this verified credential in such a way that I could store it in a wallet on my cell phone. 
So I've got my cell phone. I can actually take that information out of the blockchain, store it in my wallet. And then when I go somewhere, I can actually scan it. And part of the whole verified credential system is that I can have an expiration date around a credential. I can also have in that verified credential an endpoint that the user has to actually go and verify that that credential is still legitimate. Well, what source are they going to hit? They want to hit something that they know is backed by some type of cryptographic evidence, and that would be a blockchain. Yeah. So now you can come full circle into not only can you issue portable verified credentials, but now you can anchor it against the blockchain. That's it. So not, it's an awesome convergence, isn't it? Yep. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to take, uh, we're going to address um, one or two questions from, uh, from what I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about, because I know this is something you've you've been um, uh, adamant about and championed uh, all along for us at Burst IQ, is the whole aspect of one making it easy and making sure our cloud uh, always stays up and is secure. So I want to talk a little bit about you. Give a shout out to your team um, with the recent audit results, but also also that whole de uh, data ops, you know, and how you how you've thought about data ops and the kinds of tools you're starting to embed within the whole stack and both in data ops, as well as, you know, kind of briefly, you know, what we provide for uh, everybody, you know, reference analytics and understanding type tool sets. So, and, you know, take a couple of minutes doing that. We're going to, and then we'll address a couple of questions. Well, I think first and foremost um, is really credit to the entire Burst IQ technical team. Um, we have teams that we talk about, um, the development team and our cloud engineering team, and both um, are excellent, have from some fantastic developers that we work with that have helped build this platform into what it is today. And we just successfully completed our third annual SOC 2 Type 2 audit, uh, with no exceptions again. Um, that is by no, uh, no amount an easy feat but it's a wonderful feat when we get that checked off and get through that. Um, so a huge credit out to the entire team who, who did the heavy lifting to get that accomplished. And so what does that mean though in a real world example? Well, uh, when our clients enter into relationships with their users and their customers, and they have the need to prove that the platform, the data platform they're using is secured and follows all the NIST standards and has a set of control policies and does you know, pen tests and, and, and all the things that we do to ensure your data security, we could provide them with a third party independent audit results of that and that's called the SOC 2 type two audit. And that is what allows a lot of our clients to walk into say a hospital system and buy, go right through security with that certificate and say, yep, um, we do trust that platform and we don't mind your data being stored on it, which includes PII, PII, and other types of sensitive information. So that is part of the entire package of the data uh, platform, not just um, you know, the functionality we provide or the blockchain, but that is that independent security uh, audit that we can provide. Um, finally, uh, there's a lot of functionality within the platform that we leverage to bake it as close to the data as possible. And I, I don't have time to get into all of it because we want to get to some questions, but some of the things that we've done is put um, like rules-based engines and rules-based workflow analysis, um, state machine management, so that you can put that on the platform raw and direct such that as data moves in, and as you know, data, Frank's term, data has gravity, data has, intelligence, data has a uh, weight to it. And when it comes in, it, it can drive itself from one state to the next. And so by baking that intelligence right onto the Burst IQ platform within the blockchain, data can then live and move independently of having to write source code and server code and other things. So that's, that's one way that we help leverage. And then on top of that, um, we have out of, an out of the box, um, I've used the term Tableau Lite, although some people say it's actually more functional than Tableau for what they need. So take that with a grain of salt, but you can actually turn on our web application and get data analytics out of the blockchain off of the on-chain data right away. And so now that's the more uh, uh, historical view of the data, but then you can bake in AI and other types of machine learning in order to do prescriptive 
and predictive analytics right from that raw blockchain data. So there's a there's quite a few different ways that we can um, get more intelligence baked onto the data with the platform. Um, hopefully that covered your question, Frank. Yeah. I can talk, I get it was awesome. So you know I'm gonna I'm gonna slide over to a couple couple questions. Um, I'm gonna have you take one. We we got we got about four minutes, I think, four or five minutes. I think we can get these questions, uh, key ones done real quick because uh, I'd like a minute or so just to close out. Um, so, okay, first question. Um, what are some examples of adopting Burst IQ solutions and technology to improve performance of larger multi-state health systems? You know, I think a good one, um, a good one might be, uh, might be our, friends, our friends with Empiric, but, uh, and I'll throw one in after, after you really kind of hit that. Again, 20 seconds. So it, it, wow, 20 seconds. You're really limiting me, Frank. I can't talk just yet. <laughs> um, yeah, we've actually engaged in a couple of things like that, um, both at a state HIE level and at a sovereign right. HIE level. So we've actually used blockchain uh, to design out. I'm that glad you hit those. I'm glad you hit those. As I mean, really what people get is a little mini HIE, I mean, not a mini, but it's full function HIE. Yep. Right? It's a full fledged collaborative environment that you can then use the data ownership and consent contracts to leverage anything from HIEs to collaboration uh, like our research foundry. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and we, we do have lots of hospital system data on the platform now, um, as well as it's been used as, you know, kind of foundation for digital front door technologies, even consumer apps. Yep. So there's a good spectrum. So whoever asked that question, Ping Angie, we're happy to dive in a little more in depth with you. Um, okay, so the next one, um, please speak to your views on the extent to which digital processes, i.e. digital ledgers, smart contracts, and digital consents can ultimately replace administrative workflows, contract red lines, et cetera, that drive the transaction costs of sharing data, and what can academic health learn from other industries like fintech, energy, and their use of these technologies for lowering the cost of microtransactions? So this is from Rick. Thanks, Rick. Um, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, well, I think we kind of touched a little bit on this when I was talking about how that data has inherent intelligence yeah. and workflow to it. So you can already see that um, let's, let's break apart legal contracts and redlining because the blockchain itself is immutable. You can go back through every version of the red line and you can also see which version everybody signed. So yeah, I, you can think of DocuSign in that sense where I'm going to electronically sign uh, this paperwork that I've got, but this allows you to go back and see every red line and ch uh, check every one that came out. And then you can see which one was the final and the, um, you know, the approved red line version. Um, but the cost of sharing data, I'll touch on this real quick. There's a big industry right now of uh, healthcare data brokerage. So brokerage companies will gather data and then they turn around and sell it and um, I, I've seen it as primitive as they put everything on a thumb drive and FedEx it to you. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, I, I know there's one point I had I didn't specifically talk to it. I think, I think you know, what the trending is, and, and I believe this is, a, um, this isn't a Gartner, it's a Silva, I think, report that 35% of all corporations in 2021 uh, are buying, or, buying and or selling data. So that's a lot, and that's only going to grow faster. To your point, so data marketplaces are pretty a pretty key aspect of of life in the future. And using um, consent contracts to simplify that whole process. Yep. So you know what what we see as well in terms of kind of emergences is it being applied in the supply chain supply chain with data triggers as well as you know applying smart contracts to auto adjudication of payments and and analysis in terms of understanding a, in the health space a claim. Is there any missing charges? Is there additional charges? And again, managing the process through through the claim uh, aspect. So lots of room for, um, for replacing our, call it in the hyper automation space, to use blockchain and smart contracts to replace administrative checkpoints and even inject kind of manual manual checkpoints along the way. So you get the get a combination of automation and smart contracts where you can codify those things as well as kind of human intervention if you need it. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. Uh, and this I think is a quick, a quick answer, right? Do you see blockchain's product as rip and replace type of technology for things like AWS S3 data buckets or is it complementary technology maybe may used for a different purpose? 
Um, it, it, it's certainly not a fully rip and replace. I mean, any type of blockchain technology can always be used as complementary to any kind of storage system that's already out there today. Um, I, it really depends on the use case on whether or not how much you move from, say, a, just an, an open S3 type bucket or an open data platform to something that's a little more full featured like the Burst IQ platform. I think that's a case by case thing, but it's not an always rip and replace. You know, but in the concept of data network, so you're going to see you're going to see the need to plug in things like S3. And it, it comes down to really, really um, assigning trust to where the data source comes from. And you know, are you are you trusting that? And you know, are they man? And how are they managing? How how deep are they managing? At least you're going to know what the data is from a trust perspective when it enters the network, and you're able to layer layer it, and you still can query and interact with it. And even for that for that matter, store secure data objects in those kind of data stores. You know, they they really are independent of the data store themselves um, in terms of embedding metadata and attributes. That's right. Um, okay, so I think that's the last one. Yeah, I think I think that is. Um, and so we're coming right up on time. I'd like one minute just to kind of close out before I turn it back to Angie. And this is this is a little more of a philosophical kind of thing. Um, and given given some lesson learned from the last year. Uh, and again, this, this is something we we're very passionate about. And I just want to share it at this point in time, because, you know, what COVID-19 did, it, you know, it, it did bring one thing um, into focus for just about everyone on the planet. Uh, you know, we learned what we learned from COVID is that we're all interconnected, um, that the action in one area can quickly turn into a worldwide crisis or even a worldwide benefit, uh, particularly if you look at how the pharma companies come together to really produce these vaccines in record time. And, you know, but more importantly, we learned that our stories kind of weave together our stories about ourselves and how we live and who we are as human people, uh, human beings, weave together to catch a much broader, broader view of the diverse factors that impact our health and well-being, you know, and not just health care, right? Health and well-being, which is lots of aspects of our life. But we also learned how much is still a mystery, you know, but what's what's really happening here is it's driving the demand for more and more data and what seems like an endless list of questions, you know, data about individuals, data about our interactions with each other, data about how all this connectedness impacts health. And also we see kind of an emergence potentially of, data about us and, and, and things that may not, you know, may not be a good thing for us in terms of how they're interpreted. Um, so that, that aspect of privacy and really pushing forward kind of this whole notion of individual liberty is really important. So as an industry, we really are challenged to enable this interconnectivity and capture that kind of insight in a way that uh, we can gain value from it while still respecting the dignity and sovereignty and value and rights of each person. So that's kind of fundamental how we look at life. And I would add really to really kind of pushing forward this notion of health ac access and equity to everyone on the planet because data can be that, that thread that ties a whole lot of this together in terms of understanding each other and, and really being able um, to have a little more compassion with each other. So again, you know, we're, we're in the process of creating a future um, where we're really all, where our data is connected and all the and, and we need to really support and advocate for rights uh, to be respective and and really build a model where shared incentives and, and the broader incentives are aligned, just not corporate incentives. So I don't think COVID changed any of that personally. I just think it accelerated it. And so a lot of these trends you're going to see accelerate in terms of adoption um, and driving how all this market moves forward. Uh, through 2021 and beyond. Um, with that, I want to personally thank everybody for, for joining uh, the webinar. I'm going to kick it back to Angie to kind of administratively close us out um, and uh, hope everybody has a wonderful and amazing day today. Thank you.